It took me at least three hours to go through this Native American exhibit, but I managed to shrink this video down to 32 minutes. So kudos to me. If ever your art director's like, I need an Aztec man with a Clovis spear holding a Chaco style pot around 1050 AD, you can thank me for this video. Apparently there were two types of spear points. So these were for spear tops, girl, not for arrowheads. In South America, in red here, the spear points had fishtails. In North America, in blue here, most notably New Mexico, the spear points looked like ones without the tails. These were called Clovis points because they were most often found in Clovis, New Mexico. So these are three animals found as fossils with Clovis points in them. These are the Western horse, different from the European horse that were carried over to America in the 1500s. They look more donkey-like. Other fossils found with Clovis spear points were the ancient bison, which is much larger than today's American bison, and the giant ground sloth, which stood 10 feet tall. Clovis points were also were found with the American mastodon, which is a smaller version of a mammoth, and the woolly mammoth, which could be 14 feet tall at the shoulder. A significant difference between the American mastodon to the left versus the woolly mammoth on the right was the mastodon had these chunky grills, while the woolly mammoth had these frilly teeth on the right. This Clovis spear was found in Kimswick, Missouri. And in the center here, this mastodon tooth and to the right, the mammoth tooth were both found in Illinois. This was a mammoth tusk found in Russia and said to be 1.8 million to 10,000 years ago. I think I believe in the biblical age of the earth being only 6,000 years old, but meh. Here is an illustration of a whole town of Native Americans taking out a mastodon or mammoth. Take out the carcass and turn it into elephant jerky. I have no excuse sometimes. Do I need a trial to make it legit that I'm touching everything in this museum? Anyway, these phones are super informative. Rocks that were dense were made into spear points. Flexible and strong plant fibers were made into baskets, ropes, and clothes. Glossy shells were made into fish hooks, spoons, and jewelry. This shows that in a time of less food, people ground acorns to make flour to bake things. You can't eat an acorn raw, but they would wash the flour to make it non-toxic. How are people so smart to figure this out? More than 10,000 years ago, ancient people settled near the southern coast of what is now called California. Here they survived a large variety Wild the blow winds use different types of rocks as different grades to make different grades of cornmeal. One hour of doing this only made around three cups of cornmeal. So lucky I can just go to Sprouts for cornmeal. Which is exactly what I did to make this cornbread. So I noticed Chicago has a great respect for Native Americans and their heritage. There are signs in a lot of the exhibit that show when something has been taken out of a shelf for sacred reasons. These are stone malls from 8800 to 1600 used by Puebloans in Arizona. 
My only frame of reference for this is when Pocahontas' other man, Cocoam, hits John Smith with a stone mall. Yep, I googled Pocahontas' other man to research this. Side note, in my 30s, I think I would definitely choose Cocoam over John Smith. Stability, for one. Family dynamics. Probably rich with organic salmon with real omega-3s. Anyway, I digress. I had to record the entire pottery room because Jay is such a pottery fanatic. So Jay Chan, here's your segment. Why do you need a pot in the shape of a donut? These ceramic pictures are called Chaco style because they were found in 1050 to 1150 AD in the Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. This is a ceramic canteen in the Cibola or Tularosa style. Um, it's curvilinear and it was created in AD 1100 to 1200 in Arizona. Uh, Mesa Verde pottery is known for these distinctive mugs. This first one is in what they call the Muck Elmo style and it was found in Colorado and created in AD 1100 to 1250. is a Tumbaga figurine found in Cundinamarca, Colombia and created in 8800 to 1600. Oh, I didn't know this but jade is called um, greenstone and other greenstones are called uh, serpentine and these were more valuable in ancient Colombian societies and gold. Redstone was a sign of rank, so Tyrona leaders, they would show their authority by trading or giving away redstone and greenstone beads. Meal drinking vessels contained a uh, fermented drink known as chicha, which is a beer made from maize. Uh, this brew was consumed at feasts hosted by Tyrona leaders. This was made from Magdalena, Colombia. I think this chart is so fascinating because it just shows what was going on around 200 BC to 8500. Um, for example, the bottom left, it says the Nazca Society on the Peruvian coast uh, created the Nazca lines, which were these large geometric and animal shapes on the land. And at the same time, um, to the right, uh, it shows uh, in the Eastern Hemisphere, it shows that uh, the Jewish rebellions against Rome had failed leading to the flight of the Jews from the from Judea, um, which was like the Jewish diaspora. And um, it's just fascinating to me because um, I'm looking at like the verses that uh, Jesus talked about, um, like Mark 13, 14 and Matthew 24, 15, which uh, refers to the abomination of desolation, um, which is the sign that would serve as a warning to flee Judea immediately. And um, this is, yeah, this is when, um, I think in 70 AD, um, the Romans destroyed the temple in Jerusalem and uh, all the Jews were fleeing. But again, I digress. Um, these are the period of the Hopewell Indians. And this is a helmet shell uh, from Hopewell in Ohio. 
uh, in AD 100 to 400. I've definitely seen this hand before. Um, these are the Hopewell Indians. They would take the mica, uh, M-I-C-A, from the mountains in western North Carolina and eastern Tennessee, and they would um, slice the mica into these sheets that artisans can form into different shapes. So um, these are gigantic earrings um, called ear spools that Hopewell men and women wore and they would actually have to cut their earlobes to wear them. Um, but they were also probably more um, symbolic than just fashion. Um, they uh, represented uh, east, west, north, and south. The Hopewell made crafts from uh, many different types of material like stone, mica, and copper and they would feature birds, uh, water birds like ducks, spoonbills, raptors, owls, hawks, and other subjects. This is a copper and bone pan pipes made by the Hopewell. Um, this is a replica, but they would take the wing bones of a heron and create these pipes, and the pipes are cut to the length that would make more natural sounds. Also a replica of a copper and wood headdress made by the Hopewell in Ohio in AD 100 to 400. Uh, when archaeologists first excavated this headdress, it was found flattened um, because uh, the earth crushed it. It's a ceramic urn made by the Zapotec in Osaka State, Mexico. These are also from Osaka State, Mexico, created by the Zapotec in AD 200 to 800. And um, they are a figurine and a figurine mold. Mayans, um, this was a, a ceramic figurine of a Maya ball player in Chiapas State, Mexico in AD 250 to 900. A green stone necklace made by the Mayans in 8250 to 900 found in the Cayo district in Belize. These are ceramic vessels showing Mayan leaders from 250 to 980. I think the left one is from the Chiquimula department in Guatemala and the right one is from the Orange Walk district in Belize. This says in Maya religious beliefs, the gods needed to be fed with blood, uh, just as children needed to be fed with milk. And royal women and men practiced a type of ritual in which they offered their own blood to various gods. Many stone carvings depict these bloodletting rituals. Very interesting to me because it says um, across a lot of cultures, anthropologists um, are like confounded why um, ancient peoples all had some kind of um, bloodletting or sacrifice in their rituals. It says that some societies in the ancient Americas, like the Maya, they did bloodletting uh, or human sacrifice. And like this confounds like anthropologists. They think it's because they thought that it made people more receptive to spiritual messages. But it's just so interesting because at the same time, my church pastor has been talking about Hebrews. And in Hebrews 9.22, it says, In fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And also in Hebrews 9.27, it says, Just as man is destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ was sacrificed once to take away the sins of many people, and he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. So it's almost like intuitive, like in any culture, it seems that blood is something that is needed for uh, cleansing of sin. And uh, I'm glad that Jesus did it once and for all.
This is an obsidian axe created by the Mayans in AD 250 to 900 in the Orange Walk district of Belize. These Teotihuacan masks are pretty generic. Uh, they were worn by leaders and the reason why they look very generic is that they uh, believe that leaders um, were not any individual and sometimes they were led by groups of people. Teotihuacan is that large pyramidic structure with different architectural complexes around it northeast of Mexico City. Um, it links the Temple of Quetzalcoatl, the Pyramid of the Moon, and the Pyramid of the Sun. These are moche figurines and pottery from Peru and archaeologists found that these people sacrificed either their own warriors or enemies for 300 years. They were offered at the Huaca de la Luna, or Temple of the Moon. Animals played a huge part of the Moche religion uh, this particular one is a ceramic vessel of a feline in AD 100 to 800, found in the Ancash region of Peru. The Moche people of Peru grew a variety of crops like corn, squash, peanuts, and potatoes. We are on to the Wari people, um, which were the people of the central highlands of Peru between 8,500 and 1,000. They expanded their homeland in the mountains by conquering neighboring groups and forming alliances. And they brought other ethnic groups under their rule and um, became an empire, which is the first in the Andes. These are ceramic vessels from the Nazca from 100 BC to 8300. They populated the Ica region of Peru. This is a comparison of Wari and Nazca pottery. Um, this is when the Nazca uh, came into conflict with the Wari. Um, the pottery started looking kind of similar, um, but as you can see in the pottery to the right, there's dismembered body parts from the warring between the two nations. This was a Peruvian child mummy um, with figurines uh, buried with it. Tenochtitlan is a city um, which was the capital of the Aztec Empire and a wonder of the ancient world. It is famous for its great engineering and it was built on a swampy island in the middle of Lake Texcoco, where Mexico City is today. Tenochtitlan was the center of Aztec political power and a hub where rulers managed the empire. They uh, amassed vast wealth through taxes.
Tenochtitlan was the capital for the Aztecs, and Cusco was the capital for the Incas. These are vessels from the Incan Empire. These are copper and stone weapons from the Incans in the Cusco region of Peru from AD 1400 to 1532. Stone llamas from the Incans from 1400 to 1532 AD. On the hillside above Huanuco Pampa are hundreds of colca, which are buildings that stored food. Round colca held maize and square colca held potatoes, and ventilation shafts kept the food from spoiling. This image was created by Aztec scribes working with Spanish clerics after the conquest, and it shows Aztec people suffering from smallpox that was transmitted by Europeans. Um, smallpox wiped out um, whole communities and devastated America. So Felipe Guaman Poma de Ayala was a Huayman Poma or Waman Poma was a um, nobleman known for uh, being a historian uh, the, and who talked about the ill treatment of the natives of the Andes by the Spanish Empire after Peru was invaded. Such people were highly esteemed because of their ability to use the key. So a Cheyenne artist of the Great Plains painted this buffalo hide painting um, showing the warfare between the Cheyenne people and uh, the Europeans and this type of warfare continued for over 400 years. Now we're on to the Alaskan Indians. <laughs> Whew. This is a salmon trap. Top here is a model umyak, and it is made out of bone and lashed with sinew. Walrus hides were used to cover these type of boats, and this is from South Greenland. The bottom is a, another model umyak, which is used by Eskimos in many parts of the Arctic for whale hunting and long distance travel, and this was in North Greenland. This is a sled created by the river people of southwestern Alaska in the lower Yukon River. Oh, this was a sled dog. These are waterproof sealskin boots from the Kozbu Sound in Alaska. This is a tobacco mortar in the form of a foot found in the northwest coast. This is a chief's coat with armine skins, a cloth backing and beadwork with a raven design worn at potlatches. And this is from my favorite Indians, the Haida. These are masks made by the Kwakutl of the central northwest coast. And um, these are really large masks. They have movable jaws and other parts and strong three-dimensional carving. Kwakutl were proficient in making transformation masks. 
They were dark green or had blue painting around the eyes and over the nose, usually indicating um, that they were from this people. To the northwest, there were the Bella Kula masks. And these characteristics were also large with movable jaws and three-dimensional carving. Um, the Bella Kula masks are hemispherical with large lips and no chin. They have truncated conical eyes set into deep orbs and the eyes are not outlined. Masks were frequently painted with cobalt blue. This was from the Tlingit tribe of Alaska and this was a beaver headdress. So this was a house post that belonged to a woman in the Eagle Freightry and it shows an eagle above a beaver. It was created in 1862 by the Haida. These were artist tools uh, of the Haida people. They painted these totem poles and they mixed their own minerals and other sources. Several colors were known and used, but the basics were black, which was from charcoal or graphite, red from red ochre and hematite, and blue-green from copper minerals. A yellowish color was obtained from limonite, a blue from copper carbonate, and white from burned clam shells. They also had a binding agent made from chewed salmon eggs and saliva. A stone palette, often with compartments for each color, held the paint. I love the story of this house post or totem pole. It was carved in honor of Shai Yus, which is featured on top, and his brother Wakaninish the third, who is featured below. Uh, so Shai Yus was a chief and he gave 40 potlatches. Um, when the amount she used was planning to give was known, all the guests stretched out their tongues in amazement as is shown by the top figure of this pole. So the brother who's at the bottom uh, was expected to be a great whaler and is shown with a high e tulik, which is a supernatural animal of Wiccaninish the second in his mouth. This charm, however, had no effect on Wiccaninish, who became a Christian and acquired the name of Joseph. And Joseph later sold these poles to the Field Museum here in Chicago in 1904. I love the Haida because I think I once did a little diorama with clay little Indians in grade school. Um, they are an indigenous group that have traditionally occupied um, the Haida Gwaii, which is an archipelago just off the coast of British Columbia in Canada. And what I love about them mostly is just the amazing totem poles they created. Most poles are hand carved from the trunk of a single red cedar tree. After stripping the bark and sapwood, the carvers cover the pole in charcoal drawings, mapping the forms of each figure. For the next several months, the carvers shape the pole with chisels, curved knives, axe-like tools called adzizes, and today with chainsaws. The protruding wings, fins, and beaks are carved separately and then joined before the pole is painted. So totem poles like these made by the Haida was a symbol of the owner's wealth and status.
there's these two tall totem poles, right? But on the right one, there's actually a door to uh, opening of um, the house. And um, these were found in communities along the Pacific Northwest coast. Grizzly bears like this one typically have large ears, flared nostrils, menacing teeth, and stand upright. But for some carvings, only the artist knows the identity. There are no records identifying the upside down figure in the bear's mouth. So I hope you enjoyed my tour of the Native American history in the Field Museum. It brings me back a lot of good memories of making school dioramas with those like edible rock candies and um, clay figures, um, especially the Hata totem poles. Those are just super beautiful and amazing. Um, so I hope you enjoyed this just in the time for uh, Thanksgiving and being thankful for um, just the place we live in um, and just uh, recognizing the part of uh, the world that we're covering and um, taking over from um, uh, Native Americans who really deserved um, a better history, you know. So anyway, have a good week, guys. Bye.